All right. Hi, everyone. Welcome to this month's landscape lecture. I'm Sarah Cunningham, uh, the Coastal Training Program Coordinator here at the Reserve, Mr. Randis Reserve. And today we have with us Ray Mooney and Carla Van Zant from the city of Port Aransas to talk about the semi-recent update to the Port Aransas landscape ordinance and some plants that um, would help get you up to code, um, not up to code, but in any case, I'll let them take it over. Uh, you are muted, Carla. If you look on the screen to your left, there should be a big button that says mute, unmute. Got it. <laughs> All right, I'm Carla. I'm with the city. I'm the code enforcement officer. And a couple of years ago, city council asked that city staff um, review the landscape ordinance. So we had a little workshop put together with residents, master gardeners, and staff. And this is the ordinance that we came up with. Um, it makes it much easier. The other one was very hard to enforce. Um, you, you had to be a master gardener in order to understand what they were asking in the old ordinance. Um, so we really wanted to focus on the entry corridor, which is from 1A north into the city um, to Cotter, and then down Cotter um, for those businesses. That's what people see when they come into Port Aransas. So um, any of those businesses, that type of thing along there, um, they are required to have all their landscaping now in the front. Um, whereas residential properties, they can use the whole lot. But as far as the entry corridor, they have to use what's visible to the public. Um, Ray's going to go over some of the, the plants that, you know, we would like to see used that are native. Um, what's in the evasive, invasive. Um, Generally, if someone is building a new residence, they bring us a set of plans. In the set of plans, they have to contain, it contains the landscaping. Um, it's done by a point system and um, much easier than the old point system for sure. Mm -hmm. um, and we review it, we make sure, you know, they, they meet our point requirements and then they're issued the permit before they're, they're issued their certificate of occupancy for that residence, um, we, we make sure that they meet our ordinance um, as far as the landscaping goes. If there's a house that is facing a remodel, um, if it's over 50% improved, they have to meet the ordinance. Um, we always ask for voluntary <laughs> compliance with the ordinance. Um, which which most of the residential, the single family residences meet it regardless. Um, I mean, the, the ordinance is, is pretty simple now. Like I said before, it was it was pretty confusing. Um, I'm not sure if y'all want to ask me some questions about it. If you have had a chance to look at the ordinance, um, there was one slide that had maybe the point system on it yeah. or something that might be too long. Do you have any handouts on any of this? Did you bring one? I not, but we can have them printed and either um, 
can pick them up at our office or city hall or something. Yeah, I, we can definitely print it out for you. Uh, we have, if, and we have a sample too of what we would look for. Right here's the sample uh, of a plan. That's it. <laughs> oh, that's that's for a single family residence. Yeah. Yeah. Shrubs. Yeah. Um, it's twenty percent of the lot size is what it has to be landscaped. So, what about for all those short term rentals that are cement in a building? Cement in a building. <laughs> that if they have a backyard, most likely. It meets the ordinance. Even though it's a rental, it's not a a dwelling where anybody lives. It, it, it's still a dwelling unit. It's still a, a single family residence. Uh, so in this, like this example showing the pervious ground cover. So that could include like if you had um, anything that'll allow water to infiltrate. So if you wanted extra parking, this is encouraging people to use pervious pavers or rock or something or something with some grass that way it's not as much concrete there's, there's a great example on sea birdies um where their driveway is hatched and oh yeah with with the grass in between and um, if you haven't seen it i suggest you go look at it it's, it looks really good and at least that way it's you know And there, there's another one on Cotter, I believe, too. Mm -hmm. One of the houses. Okay. But um, I, mean, I really. Oh, the ventures. Where mine comes in, I guess. Yeah. You want me to? Yeah. Okay. Okay. So, um, Tom Ray, I'm the nature preserve manager for the city. And so I've served on the uh, working group with Carla and other city staff and a bunch of um, folks like yourselves, like residents and business owners. And one thing that we did include in the ordinance is that if you have any of these invasive plants or if new invasive plants emerge that might come up on texasinvasives.org, you don't get any points for these things. So uh, if you plant, if you love, you know, Brazilian pepper tree and you plant one in your yard, that's not gonna count uh, for, um, you know, 200 <coughs> points for eight foot tree. So it has to be something that's not gonna be invasive uh, to our environment here. But they can go ahead and plant the Brazilian pepper tree? We can't um, at this point in time, it is not against city code to have them. And that's a very difficult kind of thing Maybe Carla could get more into that with the code. Um, but most of these things you cannot buy in a nursery anymore. It is against the law to buy, to sell them. So um, most people, the way they're coming up on their properties, they're just growing and they're letting them grow because they don't know how harmful they are to the environment. And they're excited that they have like a big tree or something. And, um, but meanwhile, it's causing problems all over the place. So. Um, this is just one way that we can um, discourage the use of them. Um, most new builds, you know, they've cleared the lots, so they're probably not going to have them. But they are, I see a lot of lots being cleared where um, white lead tree and a Brazilian pepper tree are growing along the fence and they keep them there because they think it's something great. So, um, <laughs> but um, does the city have any program to help private? landowners, private property owners, to get rid of some of these invasive plants? We have worked on, we have gotten some grants for those things. Currently, we do not. We worked with the University of Texas Marine Science Institute and the Coastal Bend Basin Estuaries Program last year, and we had some money to help uh, homeowners. Um, we, we had contractors go remove the trees and treat them and then we gave them a free tree. So we're looking for additional funds to do that, but we do, if you email me, um, and maybe someone can put an email in the chat for the people online and I'll give you guys business cards. We have a list of homeowners that need help. And when we have uh, work days, we do 
try to get to a couple of those homeowners to help them because we know it's they grow really fast and they're not um, easy to remove and it costs a lot of money. Like the Brazilian pepper trees uh, and uh, some of these others, they did, you know, they looked dead after the freeze, but now they're like eight feet tall again. Um, so uh, we all thought maybe that was the silver lining of the freeze, but it wasn't. Um, Ray, can I ask a question? Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, is this list of invasive plants to avoid, is that clear in the ordinance? Yes, I think so. Oh, no, yeah. no. It says there, we have a list. Yeah, we have a list. It says that uh, city um, hall has a list. Um, that way, when things change, like if a new invasive plant emerges, then we can be adaptable to that. So um, this was the list that we generated though when we created the ordinance. Um, and uh, I think all of them are on the texasinvasives.org. And these are things that do grow here in Port Aransas and are a problem. Um, yeah. What is the tree here? The oh yeah, sorry. So the bottom tree is uh, China berry. Yeah. And then I have a question for you on can we spider or Okay. Um, yeah, actually, there's a lot on station where they just cleared everything except for the China berries. <laughs> I saw that yesterday, I think. <laughs> but in Corpus, the China berries are everywhere. So Yeah, just, um, I mean, the China berry is invasive because of the way it grows and, and propagates. But just for interesting information, it's in the mahogany family. So that's Bill Green talking. He is a forester with the Texas A and M Forest Service. So he knows a lot about, a lot more than me about trees. <laughs> we work together on managing the Brazilian pepper tree. So he's got a lot of good information. Um, yeah, and the top one is the Brazilian pepper tree with the berries. So um, I think most people in Port A are familiar with. Uh, do you want to ask your question about bamboo? Yeah, the bamboo. Uh, admittedly, I have one in my backyard. I don't live in Port A. Yeah. I live in the Nexus Pass. But all of this is still interesting to me anyway because of the invasive plants. Tell me the difference between, and I, I have the one that doesn't spread, so it grows from ground up. Mm -hmm. I know it's considered invasive, but it's at least a little better than the one that spreads this way. Right. Oh, the bamboo is pretty easy to control. So, yeah, it's not it, like with seed, birds getting seeds from other, the other things on the list, birds get seeds and carrying them up. That's not true with the bamboo. Okay. Thank you, Bill. I appreciate that because I know there's a lot here that has a mm -hmm. hedge full of bamboo. Yeah. Okay. So, you know, in some of those cases, it might be more of an issue if you're backing up you know, to an, a wild area in Port Aransas or an empty lot where someone might not be keeping it in check and it might start encroaching on their property. Right. It's not um, like some of these others, like Bill said with the seeds that are gonna just, I mean, all the UT property had pepper trees on it. We worked hard to remove those and um, the city has a lot of work ahead of us too. We worked a lot on removing them, but we're still, it's really expensive and that's why we do try to help the homeowners um, because they just show up and next thing you know, three months later, it's as tall as you're, you know, bigger than you are. So, um, so let's talk about some good plants though. Um, so the ordinance says nothing about planting native plants, but we are trying to encourage people um, to plant Texas native plants. Um, for one, we know that they're, you know, not going to become invasive, although some can be aggressive. And um, we recently in 2019 were certified as a Bird City, Texas community, which there was four cities in the inaugural year. Um, it's a certification that Parks and Wildlife and Audubon, Texas are working on together. And um, they, it was pretty, uh, pretty rigorous, the application process on things that the city or the community has done and things that we're doing and things that we pledge that we're gonna do in the next um, three years, the certifications for three years. And so one of those things is really encouraging native plants um, for homeowners and, and also large property owners. 
um, removal of invasives, all that good stuff. And the, but the main overarching theme of the Bird City Texas program is that your community is dedicated to making safer spaces for birds within where we live and work. So, you know, we have to live here and, you know, have our buildings and our homes and all that, but what can we do to make it safer for birds? So of course, having all this open space is great, but then also you can do something in your backyard by providing native um, plants. And it's not just the plants because the native plants encourage um, native insects that are good, um, that the birds like as well. So um, like a lot of the warblers coming through right now, they eat insects. So if you have a big live oak tree, you're gonna have ton diversity of insects on there that all those warblers are gonna wanna eat. Um, or if you have the native milkweed, you know, you're gonna be providing the food for the caterpillars um, and then you'll end up with the beautiful monarchs and um, Here's just, you know, pictures of, there's a hummingbird um, and a, a butterfly sharing some nectar there. And then another example of this is the Coletta silk moth. So a lot of people freak out when they start seeing a caterpillar eating their plant, but um, it's not gonna kill it. It's gonna be okay. Just, <laughs> just be patient. And then you'll end up with something really cool in your yard. Um, uh, but yeah, unless it was just recently planted, it's probably not going to do any damage to the plant. The leaves will grow back. Um, so uh, also the native plants are going to be, you know, resistant to all of our types of weather that we have, droughts, heat, freezes. It's all very fresh in our minds with the freeze and then diseases um, in the area. Okay. Uh, yeah. Oh. Maybe you or Bill could answer this, but I noticed in the Bay Area is the black mangroves are dead and adorning. Mm -hmm. They're not coming back green. No. Right, so the trees kill those completely then, right? I think so, but there's a large seed bank. So I've seen some growing. Starting, starting. Yeah. Okay. And um, in total side note, but uh, the eighties, there was three freezes and the, the, the Bay system changed a lot from that. I was not here. I was in, I was five probably, <laughs> but um, it shifted that mangrove dominated salt marsh to the, the um, salt marsh cord grass. And then, you know, after some time we started seeing the mangroves kind of overtaking again. So I, I think it's something that like that natural change does happen here um, when we have these extreme weather events. Um, but Katie Swanson's down the hall. She would have more information on that. You can ask her when you leave. I know you know Katie. <laughs> they do all the marsh monitoring uh, up in the bays here. So, Dr. Rosie did mention something about the black mangroves too. He mm -hmm. sent Marge and I a photo. Oh, wow. Yeah, sure that too. But he, he seems to think that they were coming back. Yeah, I've, I've seen some in the nature reserve that are growing and they look like they're coming back from the seeds, but um, uh, probably will. So, um, but yeah, they don't. Well, really and Ray, it's just like yeah. you have on the slide there. The natives are resistant to the frosts and freezes, so yeah. things should come back well. Um, yeah, I would pull that up. Yeah, well, you know, that's the thing. Then a lot of the native plants they have the word weed in them. Yeah, <laughs> it's bad for business. We want. We got to, I know thistle is not the word, that's not a good example of the word weed in there, but, um, you know, they're really great for wildlife, um, but, you know, maybe a lot of people, they see something pop up in their yard that they didn't plant, they pull it right away, but um, it might be something great that's native. So, yeah. <laughs> um, and so, and your native plants are going to require fewer fertilizers and pesticides, um, especially the fertilizers they're used to living in the sandy environment here with you know, very little nutrients. So they're probably going to do really well. Speaking of which, if you would like to get your soil tested, and we have a program here that the uh, Nueces County Water Control District number four is paying for. So you can get your soil tested if you want to see if you need nutrient, you know, to add fertilizers. They're, they're paying for that free of charge in four days. So that way you don't have to over fertilize. You can check and see if necessary. Um, 
And in general, the native plants require less, less maintenance as well. And um, like all plants, they're gonna help capture the stormwater. They're gonna help clean out stormwater, which um, is something that a lot of people are concerned with right now with all the increases in um, pervious covers. So, okay, so back to the freeze. I wanted to show you guys some pictures of um, plants that these are photos I took a couple days after the freeze. And it's not like they turn brown after a couple days either. These stay, were green right after the freeze and they stayed green. So these are great plants to, um, to plant. Um, the Gulf muley grass that grows here native in Port Aransas, but it's a great landscaping plant. Um, really pretty bunch grass. Um, this time of year, it looks beautiful. And that's what it looked like after the freeze. No, no change from the day before or after it got, you know, it was 18 degrees here. Um, on the bottom left is wax myrtle, really pretty evergreen shrub, great plant here in Port Aransas. The middle picture is Yopon holly. I have a picture later that'll show it when it's got all the red berries on it, which the birds love. And then the top right is a, a wine cup that's um, a ground cover that's really pretty. It'll flower uh, in the spring. So this is what in my front yard what it looked like in February after the freeze, but you know, a couple months later or something, it had all the pretty um, dark red flowers on it. And then these are my neighbors who have all the Texas sable palms on the bottom right. And then you can see the Washingtonia, the one that's from Mexico, the tropical um, palm on the right that's all brown. So um, if you're replacing your palm, it might be a little more expensive up front to buy a Texas or a Florida sable, but um, they're, be they're better suited for our um, environment here. The Washingtonia, some of them came back um, after the trees, but a lot of them died and you know we, they're still kind of hanging around because it costs so much to get rid of them. And then you have to buy another plant. So um, it's better to maybe invest up front on the, the sable palm. So we already talked about this a little bit. So in the ordinance, you get um, points for um, permeable surfaces. So this would include grasses and stuff, but also these are great options if you need an extra parking space or you wanna put in a patio. Um, you have to make sure though that it is actually what is called permeable pavers. The permeable pavers, Underneath this surface have like coarse rocks that serve as a reservoir for water. So it's not gonna pool up top, it's gonna pool down here and then it's gonna start filtering down into the groundwater. So that's the trick with this. So you might see pretty pavers in some places but they might not actually um, be, um, they might not, not actually be the permeable type um, that are designed to help the water in, um, recharge the groundwater. Um, and so, again, reasons that we want to do all of this is with all the increases in development, this is going to help reduce the amount of stormwater and it's going to help clean up the stormwater by um, going into the ground and filtering through something. So you can also use green um, stuff for your ground cover. Um, these are just examples of other options besides turf grass. Well, of course, that's Bermuda grass, but this on the left is woolly stomodia. This grows all over the island. Got pretty little purple flowers and um, is a great option for, um, for ground cover. And then in the middle is a plant called frog fruit. Same thing, it grows wild all over the island and it has those pretty flowers and um, it's a good option. So you can think about, you know, maybe you need a spot for grass for your child or your dog, um, but you can integrate these things in there too and not just have, um, it makes it look more interesting too, having different colors and textures and uh, more diversity in your um, landscape projects. Uh, yeah. Uh, like you said, those are ground covers. Uh, mm -hmm. do the, the, as far as disease, do those, are they hardy or they, do they take yeah. um, like the disease? Are they easy to catch disease is what I'm saying? No, yeah. I don't think so. I mean, these are tough plants. Okay. I see them growing like, you know, into the street and they're getting run over yeah. and they're fine. <laughs> <laughs> so um, I think disease wise, we have the woolly stomodia and some of the nature preserve sites on um, yeah, our um, pollinator gardens and it always does really well. So you can propagate that really easy too if you find some, yes, just add a piece and 
should yeah. probably stick it in some water or dirt and you'll have a free Thank plant. You. Yeah. <laughs> cool. So, and then uh, these are good options for small plantings. Um, the scarlet sage, and there's a lot of there, that's a, the genus is salvia. There's a lot of salvia species that do really well here. That's probably the one that grows um, is maybe native right to this island. I'm not really positive, but, and I will say most of these are just Texas natives. They're not native to Mustang Island. Some of them are, but that plant um, does really well and it um, attracts hummingbirds and butterflies and stuff. And uh, yes, the, the, all of the landscape lectures, side note, I saw your note, are um, on the Parks and Rec YouTube channel. Maybe Sarah can send that out. Um, the City of Port Aransas YouTube channel. Um, so in the top, on the top right, that's chili patine. That's always a good um, plant to have in your garden and birds actually really like it. They're not impacted by the spiciness like we are. They're, they're tough. <laughs> um, Turk's cap on the lower right, that is a, a great plant. It gets, it's kind of like a shrubby and the hummingbirds love it and it does well in the shades. You could plant that under a tree if you wanted um, or a partial shade. Um, that grows really well here. In the middle of that, or the, yellow, the white flower is um, a spider lily and that if you have any wet spots, wetter areas, lower areas in your yard, um, that'll do really well there. And then lantana um, and uh, Indian blanket. So just some examples I, um, for plants that are doing really well in Port A. And so uh, as far as shrubs and grasses go, or bunch grasses, um, on the top right, that's the Siniso or Texas sage. Um, a lot of people have those here in town. It has that silver, pretty silver leaf and um, it'll flower purple a couple times a year. Um, and then the yellow flowers next to it are the Esperanza. Everybody's seen those around town. The hummingbirds are going crazy in my yard over those right now. Um, and then the bottom left is, uh, that's the Yopon holly with the, with the berries on it. So it prop, I think that's like November-ish. So it's like very, um, very festive, looks pretty. It reminds me of like Christmas. And then um, in the middle, that's called desert willow. Uh, so it's like a small tree shrub and it has those big, beautiful flowers. Those are native to like the Uvalde area. If you've ever been on the Noasis River there, they're like everywhere. Um, also the city, so um, really, really pretty. And then the Gulf Muley we already talked about is a good grass, a uh, bunch grass to add to your landscape. Okay. Yeah. Is the uh, Siniso, is that the, uh, what they <coughs> call the Mexican heather? No, that this one is much bigger. Uh, this is like a big shrub. The Mexican heather is um, like a Small. smaller and it has like a glossier green leaves, I think. And I'm not sure. I used to have that in my yard. I don't. Yeah, I don't know what happened if it was what happened to that, but what do you want to? Okay, and then uh, trees for your landscape. These are just some ones that do well in Port Aransas and um, the birds love them. If you've ever been to the birding center, we have all of these species. And um, right now with the fall migration, there are just tons of uh, warblers and other songbirds in, in the trees. Um, so live oak on the top left, the Texas sable on the uh, top right. And then the uh, lower left is uh, sugar hackberry. Um, so those berries, uh, the birds really like. And uh, the middle picture is a red mulberry. So that's a scarlet tanager this spring eating uh, mulberry fruit. I know people sometimes don't want fruit uh, with their yards because it might stay in the concrete or their car or whatever, but look at what you could have. <laughs> <laughs> this beautiful bird will show up and it'll be worth it. And then that's just a honey mesquite on the right. Um, and uh, others listed here, Ratama, those do really well uh, in the salt air as well. Okay, so I do know just a few places, I'm not endorsing them, but gills will carry a lot of Texas natives and they're very knowledgeable, they're staff, so you can ask them 
and they have a, a list on their website of things that they usually carry that are um, Texas natives. Um, and Turner's will have things too, and the same thing. They're the people that work there are very uh, knowledgeable. Those are both in Corpus. And then Heaps is in Harlingen. They have a lot of, um, they're a native plant nursery, and we've gotten a lot of stuff there. Um, Ray, Ray, can I jump in here? Yeah. Huh? Yeah, are you going to be mentioning later or now about the tree giveaway, uh, October 23rd? Oh my gosh, I totally forgot to put that on my slide. That's embarrassing. <laughs> yes, I meant to put that as a separate slide. Thank you, Bill. Um, so October 23rd, um, we are going to have a tree giveaway here at UTMSI at the Cotter Street entrance. Um, and for those of you online, we can uh, send you the link uh, to the event. It's next Friday. Uh, it's on Saturday. And we're gonna have some activities too. So you can come get a free tree, but also we're gonna be out in the Wetlands Education Center having a migratory birthday celebration, but really bring the kiddos and whoever wants to learn more. We're gonna have story time, a scavenger hunt, and uh, tours of the WEC, they call it, the Wetlands Education Center. And we have some goodie bags, a free nature preserve water bottle. This is how I'm luring you in, free tree and a free insulated water bottle <laughs> and uh, other goodies. So uh, it, it'll be fun. And um, the Arbor Day Foundation and the Verizon is sponsoring the tree giveaway. So I meant to put the species list on here and um, totally uh, slipped my mind, but on the Porter Anzis Nature Preserve Facebook page or the UTMSI Facebook page, there's a, a Facebook event that has the list of the species or just email Sarah and she'll um, get you that list of what we're gonna have. But a lot of the things we chose this year are smaller trees and that have flowers and berries because um, last year we had a lot of the bigger trees were left over. You know, in Port A, we don't have a lot of space in our yard, so, um, not everybody can fit a red mulberry or a live oak in their yard. <laughs> so we tried to, we're gonna have um, dwarf palmettos too. So they're uh, the small sable palms that uh, are native to Texas. So but they do get about six or eight feet tall. So if you want a new palm, we'll have them. They're five gallon size. So they're gonna be bigger than the tree giveaways we've had in the last um, few years. So thank you, Bill. Okay, and then just additional resources. This is something that we're gonna have available to at City Hall for people that are putting their landscape plans together, or I think if we can get copies from AgriLife, otherwise we can send you the link. But this is a really good resource. A lot of people have this. Um, the AgriLife Extension Office in um, Rockport have put this together. So it's native and adaptive plant, adapted plants for the coastal bend, and um, it's a good resource. It's got pictures of um, all the plants and uh, what wildlife like them and how big they get, where they grow well and all that. The Audubon has something similar too, but honestly, this is better because this was put together by the people that live here. So, okay, that's all. I guess I, I might be able to pull up the tree giveaway. And if you guys have questions and kind of wait on, well, no probably be too difficult to find it on Facebook right now, but she shared the link in the chat. Oh, okay, cool. Uh, does anyone have any more questions? I have a problem with the, the monarchs and trying to keep the, um, What is the plant that they like? The milkweed. milkweed. One year I had milkweed plants everywhere and I tried to retain them, keep them preserved. And now I have problem with wasps. So how do I get rid of the wasps so they don't eat the, the nice monarch cocoons? Oh, I don't know. But now I have no monarchs and, and no milkweed. So I'm afraid to start the milkweed again because of the, the other creatures that are in my yard. I, I don't think those are connected. Um, <laughs> yeah, they're di different events. Uh, um, yeah, I have a lot of problem with wasps. I don't have milkweed. 
I don't think milkweed brought in the wasps. So they're separate events. Or do you, I think she's so, saying maybe the wasps are eating the predating on the, the cocoons. In the monarchs. Yes. <laughs> what about lizards? Are they eating them too? I don't know. I'm, I'm going to have to look into that and okay. let you know. because That's got me thinking. I didn't really think of anything ever eating the chrysalis or the cocoon from these I've lost so much on our foot. Oh. There's traps for wasps. But they are very effective. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and something too to keep in mind if you want to have a monarch um, kind of garden is the nectar plants are so important. I think those get, um, we are so focused on the milkweed, uh, which is really important. Obviously, that's what the caterpillars need. So the, a lot of insects are highly specific on what plant they're going to use, which is also why the native plants are so important. They're not just going to pick whatever's there. Like, Without the milkweed, which there's several species, the monarchs aren't, you know, they're not gonna use something else. And so, um, but the butterflies need a lot of nectar. So mm -hmm. having um, things that are flowering in the fall too, when they're migrating is really important. Yeah, the, the Mexican olive is bringing in a lot of butterflies for the nectar. Yeah, it's a good one for hummingbirds too. I didn't put that on there. I should have put that tree. It's like everyone's favorite because it's, smaller and has white flowers and it's really pretty. Probably the Cape Sunny Cycle will be one of the top nectar plants that will attract butterflies. Yeah. That's what we have in front of the visitor center. Okay. And you see we start flowering at this time. Cool. Yeah, we're gonna, uh, the, the garden club adopts the, um, pollinator garden on the, if you're, if you've ever been to the birding center on the left-hand side. And in two weeks, we're going to be, they got a grant to buy a bunch of nectar plants and milkweed. The milkweed we just grew, uh, the, the members grew, but we're going to be installing all kinds of different um, Texas native plants that are um, great nectar plants. And uh, we're going to put in some signs and stuff. So pretty soon, if you go over there, it'll look totally different and you can maybe come check it out and see what you like and what you might want to plant stuff. Where is that? At the burning center at the over by the dump. It's good to hear about this because I wasn't aware of the hummingbirds lighting it. Mm -hmm. And I have a yard full of hummingbirds right now. So. Yeah. But it's I, not blooming. Oh really? For some weird reason. So I've got little esperanza plants growing every year right now. Me too. I'm like, whoa, how is this plant not invasive? Okay. I have not <laughs> I think my lawn is esperanza. And that's going to be in two weeks from now. <laughs> yeah, we're gonna be planting it on the 20, 21st or 20th, I think, planting all the plants. And then um so the signs won't be up right away, but so yeah, we got a whole all different stuff. It's gonna really nice. Any other questions, discussion topics, ideas? I think this okay. is a great program that Port Aransas is doing. And I kind of wonder if Aransas passes in this same thing, but I doubt it. Well, like somebody asked, um, the, so the city of Port Aransas Parks and Rec YouTube uh, Cage has all the recordings. Most of the lectures we've done have been more on tree care, right. caring for your palms, your grass, all that. So it's really good info and you can just buzz through it and find what you need to. Um, and we talked about mosquitoes, all different topics. So they're there for anybody to look at. Um, yeah, Kevin brought in a lot of really good experts from AgriLife and uh, it was pretty cool. With the program that you're doing with Port Aransas and your point system, is there um, is there any advantage to overachieving on your point system? <laughs> Except you get a beautiful yard. Yeah, your right. <laughs> neighbors love you. <laughs> no, I just wonder: is there anything that goes wrong if you don't? Um, have any points in your yard? I mean, is there a penalty for not? Not if it's existing. If it was already existing before the ordinance. So, yeah. okay. No, I guess what I'm saying is, I it is. 
if you had a, a nice yard and then all of a sudden, um, I don't know, you sold the house and nobody cared about it and it all fell apart. Mm -hmm. Is there a penalty for not keeping up? Um, um, or not? There, there is, the ordinance does call out that, you know, those plants should be maintained. Okay. And I mean, it's a violation of like um, Dollar General. Um, yeah, okay, that's it. It took, us a, it took us a while, but we finally, had them comply with their landscaping ordinance. Right, right. And they're doing it now. I know. And it looks 100% better already. Already. <laughs> and, um, you know, it. they were, they didn't want to install it during hurricane season. So we <laughs> waited till after hurricane season. Then we got the freeze. So uh, but it looks like, <laughs> oh, gee. Yeah. 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 <laughs> But it, I think I think they understand now that you know it, it's, it's a requirement. Important. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Good. Trees and, yeah. Does the city have any ordinance concerning the dead palms? Oh the yeah, um, I'm I'm constantly sending out letters about removing those dead palms. Um, as a matter of fact, I just had a call about one yesterday and they're supposed to be handling it, but uh, the dead palms, the dead pepper trees, I sent out hundreds of letters about the dead pepper trees and the fire hazard that they cause. Does, does the city, if they don't comply, you find them or do you go do it yourself and then back charge them? Or um, so we try, we always try to get voluntary compliance, always. Um, if they contact me and say, hey, it's gonna take me a little while, then I try to, you know, I try to work with them. Um, there are instances though where, you know, they just say, I'm not gonna do it. So I write a citation and maybe it's two or three, then they finally, you know, they finally realize, hey, yeah, I guess we do need to comply. Um, but like I was saying, the old Stripe store, I just had to, have someone go mow because the, the current owner lives in New York and he, you know, be careless. Not, not very responsive. So you could just pay the fine and let well, you know and, do it. And, yeah, it's um, it's in the process of being sold too. So get it done now. The new owner understands he's got to maintain it, but the old owner has to pay for reimburse the city for what we just paid to have it taken care of. But we definitely have avenues as far as the citations, the liens, that type of thing that we can place on the properties. <laughs> well, the Washingtonian part, at this time now, they're a safety hassle because those things yes. do break. Yeah, yeah. They do break and it have camps and uh, it may do uh, quite a bit of damage. <laughs> yeah, big eucalyptus in town. Those are huge. Like, we better cut those down soon before they dry out and just. <laughs> yeah, so they did at most of the homes that I knew they did dry, um, cut them down because they weren't going to leave back out. They're coming back, you know, from the bottom, but. Um, well, there's there's a lot of palm trees around. Yeah. You can just look at and think, oh dear. <laughs> I hope we get that done before the winds uh -huh. pick up. <laughs> well, for the people that were around in the eighties, where we had those two freezes, yeah. and, and the damage that those palms did when they started broken them, <clears throat> we had a, a couple of cars that would crash in Palmera. Mall, which was used to be a staple mall, and because oh, yes. the Washingtonians they they break. And... Yeah. 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 Okay, thank you very much. Thank you guys. Thank you. Next month, second Friday. I don't remember what the topic is. Sarah, do you remember? Yes. Next yes. month, we're going to have Bill Green talking to us about proper tree care and pruning. Yeah, that'll be next month. And Ray, could you just go over again for 
Saturday, October 23rd with this free tree giveaway and the other activity. Just so, so nine up. to 12 uh, at the Potter entrance on um, of UTMSI. So um, check out the Porter Ansys Nature Preserve Facebook page or the Porter Ansys South Jetty. It's, it'll be in there for uh, more info on, on that. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. See you all next month. Are you going to have a program on uh, vegetable?